Hello everyone, my name is Tina and I'm a volunteer for the London Environmental Network. And I'm so excited to hear from our speakers about native species, pollinators and growing food in our backyards. I know I'll learn a lot from the event and I hope you do as well. We'll be starting the session with the land acknowledgement from Sinwan, a fellow volunteer. Thanks, Tina, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. We would like to begin by acknowledging the history of the trad traditional territory and honor the long-standing relationships of the three local First Nations of this land and place in southwestern Ontario. The three long-standing Indigenous groups of this geographical region are the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Lanapilak. We would also like to recognize the three uh, First Nation communities downriver, Deshkan, Zivi, Thames River, Antler River, which are the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Anadan Nation of the Thames, and Lindsay Delaware Nation. We strive to work with these communities to continue to listen, learn, and restore the natural area back to its original beauty, support environmental initiatives, and help our communities become climate resilient. I will now pass it off to Priya for the introduction for this event. Hello everybody, my name is Priya and I'm the Environmental Outreach Specialist at London Environmental Network. Uh, we're so happy you made time in your day to attend this webinar. And as a thank you, we're partnering with London Clean and Green to give away five door prizes to attendees of this event. Door prizes include digesters, composters, or landscape products. So if you'd like to be included in this random draw, please fill out the form linked in the chat or scan the QR code on the screen. We'll do a draw at the end of this event and you'll also hear more about London Clean and Green. The Greening Your Backyard webinar is the first of many that will focus on how you can make your home more climate friendly. We're working on a program called Greener Homes London to support Londoners in retrofitting their homes and making their lifestyle changes to lower our carbon footprint. Now, just looking at the chart, you can see that personal vehicles and housing are the largest categories of emissions in London, and it's kind of empowering to know that you can make changes within those categories and have a really big impact. We're really close to starting up the program, so you're kind of getting a sneak peek into com the community engagement side of it, which will include one-on-one -on -one coaching to help Londoners green their homes. If you wanna stay updated on this program to participate, be sure to sign up for the Greener Homes London mailing list linked in the chat. Now, if what I've said really excites you and you're looking to work with London Environmental Network, we're also hiring energy advisors to support us with the Greener Homes London program. You can find the job posting on our website. And without further ado, we'll get started with today's webinar on greening your backyard. So I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, so our first speaker is Jessica from Wildcraft Permaculture. Jessica's permaculture work ranges from removing the sod in urban front yards and replacing it with native and edible plants to designing regenerative farm systems for hundreds of acres. She has designed several public food forests in southwestern Ontario and continues to provide support for them as needed. She enjoys sharing her passion with others and continuing to build upon her knowledge base. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start my screen share here. So, um, uh, yes, as, as Priya said, I'm with Wildcraft Permaculture and um, uh, given who the other speakers are tonight, there's uh, many different things I could have focused on. Um, I'm actually, we're teaching a full day workshop on Sunday. It's full, but um, with Reforest London, we're doing uh, a series of free workshops over the next, this year and next year. Um, if you get really excited about permaculture and want to learn more, um, there'll be another full day workshop in the fall. And there's a, a, another couple of workshops coming up so you can check out their website. Um, but so for today, I thought I would focus on, uh, on water because um, I could talk about edible plants and native plants, but other speakers are going to be doing that. So um, I'll start, I'll back up. And so permaculture, if you haven't heard the term, um, was coined in the 70s by um, a couple of Australians, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, uh, who was his grad student at the time. And um, 
it draws from a lot of traditions, um, traditional cultures and, and newer things that people are trying. Um, but uh, a lot of it is just kind of bringing together a synthesis of, of um, regenerative design techniques that have been used around the world. Um, and um, it's, it's a bringing together of permanent agriculture and permanent human cultures to try and create a uh, um, human society that is uh, regenerative in, and improving the ecosystems we reside in rather than constantly draining them. The quickest definition I like to give people when uh, I have the, a little elevator speech to give is just that it's designing like an ecosystem. So um, if you think of a forest, nobody waters it or weeds it or fertilizes it. it. It's a system that takes care of itself. And so we're trying to design systems like that in permaculture. And often people use it for gardening and, and backyards and uh, in farms and acreages, but um, it can also be used to how you build a house and um, how you build a business. Um, so uh, the, there's a main framework, ethical framework, which is earth care, people care, and fair share. Um, earth care is recognizing that earth is our home and that we're part of it, not apart from it. It's not, it's not humans and nature, it's humans are part of nature. We're all together in this. Uh, people care is supporting each other to move to ways of living that, um, that don't harm ourselves or the planet. And as I said before, are regenerative. So we've, you know, a long time we've talked about sustainability and sustainability is kind of um, driving down the highway. You know, what we're doing right now is driving down the highway at 200 kilometers an hour in the wrong direction and sustainability is slowing down, but it, regenerative design and permaculture is turning that car around and going back the other way. Um, so that we're replenishing our systems. And then fair share is placing limits on consumption of, um, of those resources that are scarce. Uh, but, but typically permaculture takes a very abundant mindset in that um, ap approaching problems with a view that they're, um, everybody can thrive if we just manage our resources properly, that most of the resources that we really are dependent on, um, there, there's plenty of, they're just not being used in the right way right now. Um, so given I have like 10 minutes to present, <laughs> very, very quick uh, intro, the, the way I approach a design process, um, and this is how I was taught, not everybody, uh, not all permaculturists follow this water access structures, there's actually a lot more in the scale of permanence that, than this, but um, uh, when I first come and look at the system, I look at water and how water is moving through the site, how we can hold it on the site as long as possible and use it as many times as we can before it leaves the site because water is life and without water, um, not much, not much can survive. So, um, so that's the first thing we look at and then um, access. So once you deal with your waterways and, and, and water retention, then you can sometimes that doubles up with access. So we might be storing water or moving water under a pathway and then structures um, and then plants and soil. And those things are, are easier to deal with. Actually, the, we have to start with the water and then that helps inform the rest of the design. Um, so uh, I miss most people on the call, I'm guessing are from London. And um, uh, some people have this notion that permaculture, they have to live on a farm or, or be rural to practice permaculture, which is a very, um, which is a big fallacy. There's actually a lot of um, reasons to do permaculture in the city because you're stacking functions so you have multiple uses coming out of a small space so it's great for small space design you're growing in vertical layers so that you have a lot of production happening there's a large waste stream as a resource um, uh, I don't, can't recall but I I mean, the, the number of leaf bags I've picked up from neighbors and, and straw bales in front of theaters that I bring home, <laughs> that are were used for props and I bring them home and put them in my garden or um, um, tree waste, wood chips. There's like, and I mean, not to say the whole other economy of, of waste, like with the buy nothing groups and things, but um, there's a lot of diversion that can happen. And because we're in a city, everything's close by and it's easy to have access to that. Uh, there's tons of water harvesting opportunities, sadly, because we have a lot of uh, impermeable surfaces. But if we look at those impermeable surfaces as a resource and as water harvesting opportunities, then they can be um, turned into uh, a benefit. 
There's all sorts of microclimates that happen in cities with buildings and trees and um, uh, protection from wind, fences, um, the heat that's coming off those, those surfaces, the, the paved surfaces and things also adds to, um, to heat islands, which can be detrimental, but we can try and use to our advantage knowing that it's there. Uh, and there's lots of um, people are a resource too. So there's lots of people to draw on to help you with projects and um, and help you with ideas. And um, and it's a great way to form community. The the number of people who uh, have, I know who've met neighbors and that they had never met before after living in an area for many years, just because they start gardening and growing things in their front garden instead of Instead of just having grass there, they're growing food and they're out there and they're sharing with their neighbors and then suddenly they know everybody on the street, especially kids. Um, okay, I got a timeline here. I got to keep moving. Um, so water, um, the, typically the way we deal with it in cities is pave it, pollute it and pipe it. In permaculture, we want to slow it and spread it and sink it. So this is just a, um, I don't, my mouse doesn't work in this, in this program to show you um, but the, it, where there's um, on the left, the pervious surfaces, you see there's very little surface runoff and then a lot of subsurface flow because it's being sunk into the ground, sink it and spread it. And then when there's in the urban area, there's a lot of impervious surfaces, there's a lot of surface runoff and then very little replenishment of the subsurface flow. So this is just a project example um, uh, in London here where you can see the, the blue arrows are showing where uh, how water management was being done before um, just being sent uh, away from away from the driveway and and down to the sidewalk um, and then we put in uh, as well as a whole bunch of vegetation that's producing food and and native plants for pollinators um, we also put in a dry riverbed so it's spreading that water out through the front lawn and it's passively watering all those plants. Um, so there's no rain barrel that it has to sit in and, um, and be dealt with. It just goes directly into the ground. That's your cheapest, biggest storage mechanism. Um, so here you see the water flow of where those, those two downspouts previously are, are now flowing into, into these areas where the blue is. And, um, and they're, yeah, they're watering the, the rhubarb and the apple tree and the strawberries and um, the, the false blue indigo and the cone flowers and the, all the native plants there. Um, and then this is uh, a rain garden design um, that, that takes the, is the same idea, but here there's a bit of a storage capacity. So it's coming down from the downspout. Again, there's no rain barrel here, um, but it's coming from the downspout and and then it's held in this pond system for 48 hours before it, so there's, it's lined and then there's holes in the liner so that it'll eventually trickle out. And then same thing, it's passively watering all these beautiful native plants here. Um, this was Mathis Knapvik's yard, if anybody um, in the community knows him, he sadly moved to Alberta recently. It was a big loss to the community, but um, expert in native plants and had a beautiful garden. Um, so I think that's, those are the only slides that I had prepared for today. Um, uh, just to kind of put, plant that seed in your mind to start with water and um, uh, that that is so critical in, in design systems. And there are lots of ways you can store it on site. You can store it above ground. You can store it in the soil, like the examples that I showed you. Um, and uh, once you have that, then you, if you, then you design your plant system around it and there'll be less work for you to take care of those plants because they'll be passively watered um, and you won't be um, using city resources to, and chlorinated water. Plants much, much, much prefer rainwater to chlorinated water um, or even to well water for that matter. Um, they, it's got lots of, all sorts of nutrients in it that they really like. So that's it for me. Um, I'll pass it on to the next person or back to Priya, I guess. Awesome, thanks so much, Jessica. Uh, so next we have Stefan from Carolinian Canada. Stefan is a plant ecologist and horticulturist with a keen interest in rare native plants, seed conversion and ecosystem restoration. He has propagated over 200 species of native plants from seed and curates several garden collections of these species in Norfolk County and the Niagara region. 
Great. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm actually wearing sort of two hats. I work with a volunteer group called the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance and we have a great re website full of all kinds of native plant gardening resources and information about seed conservation in southwestern Ontario. So do check out our website for lots of background information. Um, including lovely garden charts such as this to help you through your garden design process. But tonight I am not actually here to talk to you about garden design so much as I am here to talk to you about the broader picture of plant conservation and how that relates to the native plant industry and the native plants that you want to use in your garden and your restoration. So I'm also here with Carolinian Canada Coalition uh, and they are a broad uh, partner group of conservation um, organizations across the southwest of Ontario, which is not only the most densely populated uh, region of Canada, but it's also the most biodiverse region of Canada. So as you can imagine, there are often conflicts between what the plants and e ecosystems need and what people want to use the land for. So um, Carolinian Canada and the Carolinian zone is known for its diverse flora, including our emblem, the tulip tree. You may also know us, uh, you may also have heard of us from a, a wonderful garden initiative called the In the Zone program, which uh, has two components. There is a nursery tagging program that lets you know when you're in the store that you're purchasing a truly local, ethically seed sourced, seed grown um, native plant, and you're supporting a local green economy. Um, so there are a number of plants that are sold as wildflowers or, or they may be native, they may be, they may be imported from a farm in Oregon and not very genetically diverse or well adapted to our climate here. So look out for that tag. Also, if you do have a plant garden of any kind, including a native plant garden and a restoration, please consider tracking your garden with our In The Zone Garden Tracker. And all of these are available through the Carolinian Canada website. And what we're doing with that tracker is um, measuring the impact of over 5,000 gardeners on the landscape like you who are doing really cool things with native plants. So I'm gonna go through this so fast because I have so many things I wanna to talk to you about. Um, this is a rare Carolinian plant that's blooming in the wild right now. Um, I want to just kind of show you how diverse and beautiful and rare some of these plants are. Some of them, like the goat's rue, only occur in one habitat, one location in Ontario, and it's threatened for all kinds of reasons. But there are all kinds of plants that aren't rare that we work with that are super important too, and they are like the matrix, the backbone of our ecosystems. They uh, create specialized relationships with insects that generate the biodiversity we see on the landscape. And of course, if you're not really sold on plants, um, everybody loves birds, right? And um, native plants feed insects, which feed birds, and everybody loves bird song. And I personally love the big birds that benefit from having more birds and more wildlife. So native plants really are the foundation of terrestrial ecosystems. And, and now this drive for ecosystem restoration, this demand for native plants um, is really actually large. There's all kinds of land managers that are trying to convert um, spaces like roadsides back to native plant habitat. Uh, this is a bit of work that I've done as a PhD student with McMaster University and the Ministry of Transportation. Of course, this generates all kinds of demand on an industry that needs to supply these plants and these seeds. We can't just run out into the woods and grab all the things we need ready, set to go for gardening. Um, and you can't wander into Walmart and buy 2 billion genetically appropriate native trees off the shelf as the Canadian govern government suggests maybe you can. Um, so we've done some of the first uh, market research, small scale market research on the demand for native plants that aren't trees. So wildflowers and grasses and seeds that's ever been done in Ontario. We also recognize that there are dozens and please do cut me off when I'm at time. Um, <laughs> We work with uh, all kinds of organizations. We recognize people have been doing seed-based conservation on the ground for decades. And this work has actually been going on, um, you know, for, for thousands of years um, through the seed keeping and traditional um, gardening practices of indigenous people. So 
at Carolinian Canada and the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance, we realized that there's really no policies that support or guide native plant restoration from seed in Ontario, like there are in other countries, the US, Australia, Europe, all, you know, continents as well, but there are really well developed seed conservation strategies around the world that we don't have. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these because they are, you know, available on the website, you can reach out to me for more information, but these are some of the objectives that we're trying to reach through a coordinated seed strategy for southern Ontario. In particular, we want to engage more people in habitat restoration um, through horticulture, through gardening. And I'm just going to quickly take you through a seed scaling process and then show you some beautiful plants that I've worked with in the past that might interest you. So this is the process of um, finding remnant seed in the wild and this is what a nursery does to scale it up. I worked for eight years with the St. Williams Nursery and Conservation um, Center and we grew at, you know, at any one time 250 different plants out in orchards like this. And there's all kinds of benefits, including increased genetic diversity, including, including increased capacity for large scale restoration. And in some cases, the seed orchards represent the only populations left in a particular region. Um, so prairie smoke is now extirpated from Norfolk County, but it was once found there. It's also kind of a, a laboratory for, for gardening where we work with plants that are not traditionally used and we find which ones are really beautiful and actually can, you know, well suited to a garden setting. So more just lovely pictures, sorry, of the orchards that I've worked in. And uh, the fact is all these plants in the wild are completely fragmented, isolated, and there's not many people collecting wild seed to scale up. Here are just some of the uncommon plants that we are working with through the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance right now. Um, Legumes are the third most diverse plant family in the whole world and Ontario has nearly 30 native species of legume that are not well studied and definitely not well conserved. However, the blue lupin um, has been well conserved uh, thanks to efforts from pioneering restoration biologists. They have been scaled up um, primarily through seed driven, seed based direct seeded restoration. Um, and here's some great examples from Norfolk County. A lot of this work that I'm referring to um, has been taught to me from various mentors, including Mary Gartshore. Uh, a lot of these lessons that I've learned have come through other colleagues, and I just want to acknowledge them, their contribution to my conversation today. I think I'm probably out of time. And um, please do ask me any questions you have about a seed strategy, collecting seed, or what you can do to help grow native plants. Thanks for your time, everybody. Awesome, thank you so much, Stefan. So next uh, we have Jacob from Urban Roots London. And Jacob is a civil litigation and dispute resolution lawyer at Learners LLP. He's a dedicated problem solver and community leader focused on environmental and public interest cases and causes. Thank you, Priya. And I'm also going to share uh, a slide deck here. And just while I'm getting it up, I'll, I'll sort of overview my uh, presentation. What I want to talk about uh, today in the 15 minutes that I have first is, is what is Urban Roots and what is Urban Roots London doing? Uh, the second one is, is how did I get involved uh, in Urban Roots? Uh, then I'm going to talk about some tips for uh, greening your backyard through growing food, uh, which is the, the connection here. And then finally, I'm going to try to share some examples of how my family, with no farming or gardening experience, took a lot of the principles that we're practicing at Urban Roots uh, and try to implement them in our own, uh, in our own yard at our own property. Uh, and uh, I think my place in the, in the presentation is, is fitting because uh, Jessica uh, and um, Oh, I'm sorry, Stefan, uh, have covered a lot of the things that we're doing on our own property. And I'll, I'll add into that some of the food production uh, that we've learned and, and adopted from Urban Roots. So I've now got up on my screen, the Greening Your Backyard with Urban Roots, uh, front logo with a lot of great photos uh, that we've taken this season. And uh, what is Urban Roots or who are we, what do we do? 
Uh, urban Roots is a not-for-profit urban agriculture project, which is dedicated to revitalizing underused land within the city uh, for producing food and distributing it locally. We're growing and distributing hyper-local healthy produce, and we're doing it in a way that it is intended to provide equitable access to nutritious, affordable food through what we call our model of thirds, where one third of what we grow uh, right off the top, right off the field is donated to community development partners to be distributed to folks who wouldn't otherwise be able to access healthy, uh, affordable produce. One third is distributed at affordable prices which is about half of your, your rate that you would pay at a, a supermarket for organic produce to uh, food-based social enterprises, um, uh, education partners, and directly to consumer at our farm gate markets. And one third is sold uh, to restaurant partners, grocers, and other uh, individuals who choose to pay full rates at our markets in order to sustain the other two streams that we distribute our food in. Uh, Urban Roots is also uh, providing agricultural employment, volunteer, and educational opportunities, and I'm happy to talk more about those uh, if there's questions. And we're doing a lot of advocacy, both at the Ministry of Environment, Climate and Parks provincially, as well as the City of London, to try to change the way that uh, regulators and legislators think about, uh, about space and using space within city limits to produce food and doing things to allow for policy change, for example, to permit uh, farm gate markets within the city, which wasn't previously allowed before last year. Um, and there's a couple of other examples of that, which, which we can talk about. Um, how does Urban Roots grow? And this is where I wanna sort of transition into some principles that we can take away. Uh, what we do is, there's a lot of different ways to describe it, um, but it's biodynamic intensive market garden style growing. Uh, we're not certified organic, so I can't say it's organic, but it's all of the practices that you would you would think uh, without any uh, chemical fertilizers or uh, herbicides, pesticides, rodenticides, fungicides, anything like that. And we're also striving uh, with the support of London Environmental Network last year to rethink waste as a resource through a community composting program where we invite members of the community to bring their food waste, kitchen scraps, uh, garden waste to urban roots if they don't have the space or desire or ability to compost it and, and donate that resource to us to turn into compost, which is then used uh, at the farm to grow more food. We're now operating on, on two locations in London with dozens of partners, uh, including charitable or community development partners, social enterprises, uh, education partners, grocery stores, and restaurants. So that, that's Urban Roots. And just as I, I talk about how I got involved, um, I'm going to just sort of flip through a couple of pictures. Uh, as I say, we, we do education. And uh, the, the quote there is important to us, and it's part of the heart of our, our mission, which is that the roots of our food and the roots of our community grow best when they grow together. And, and, and I got involved um, after the founders had started the project on about a tenth of an acre on the vacant land to think strategically about how to expand and how to inter interact with the city and the ministry in order to ensure that we were doing this in the right way to guide through some of the, the uncertain legal process. Uh, as Priya said, I'm a lawyer in, in my day job and a strategic thinker about those things and, and really just fell in love with the organization and fell in love with growing food in a natural way, reconnecting with where our food comes from. And so from effectively, and I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but one of these blocks in uh, our first season, Urban Roots has expanded its growing area uh, about tenfold on this piece of property at 21 Norland Ave. And you can see there, that's uh, aerial images from uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we have a second site, which is about uh, about a third of this size in North London. And it's all permanent raised bed based growing. There's some covered structures. Uh, there's the uh, compost bays, which we're moving our composting system into, which have just been put in. And we're, and we're looking and we're working with the city right now 
towards uh, more permanent uh, greenhouse structures to continue to expand our season and extend our ability to grow and produce food. Uh, there is a, a whole lot of things going on, which uh, could take a long time to talk about, but we're, we're growing our, our bee or apiary uh, production. Uh, a lot of it is focused on vegetables. We are very happy to say that we just purchased that land, which you just saw it is spring and are now starting to plan um, some sort of permaculture style orchards uh, along the outskirts of the property to add fruit and nut production to the annuals vegetable production, uh, which is, is gonna be very exciting over the next couple of years. And then, as I said, some of what we're doing is advocacy. It's, it's changing the way that the community thinks about food production. It's educating uh, on how to produce food locally and, and keep the food distribution system more local. And it's changing the way that policymakers think about regulating uh, food production, regulating the use of land and space within the city, which is not always easy. It's a, it's a hard slog. And I know that Len is doing a lot of work, um, not just on food production, but, but thinking about greener policies. And we're working a lot with Len. Uh, but, but as an example, uh, we had to uh, advocate through ministry provincially and through the city to be able to run the community composting program. As, as most of you probably know, London doesn't offer a green bin program or an organic waste diversion stream. And so we thought, let's, let's invite people to bring that organic waste to the farm where it can be processed and used as compost to increase our yields and increase the amount of food we can grow. But that required me as a lawyer to put on my thinking hat and work through some of the legislation and regulations and, and help to uh, position that in order to get those approvals. And in the same way, doing farmers markets where we can sell directly to consumer from our property in the heart of the city of London isn't something that anybody had ever heard of before, or at least um, you know it wasn't done and there wasn't a policy for it, so they didn't know how to deal with it. So. These are types of things that, that Urban Roots is, is really taking the mantle on and trying to promote so that we can improve the ability for others to pick up the spade, so to speak, and, and carry on that journey. So transitioning from what Urban Roots does at a large scale, um, I've got a few tips and then I said, I'm gonna share some examples of how my family's implementing these on our own property. And I put them up and I'll briefly explain some of them, um, although I think some of them are self-evident. So one is start small. You don't need a two and a half acre piece of property to grow food. Um, as, as in some of Jessica's examples, you can grow uh, food in a very small space, just rethinking your space. Um, and, and so start small, keep it under control, um, grow what you eat. Don't, don't go out and try to grow all sorts of fancy food because it's gonna look good on Instagram, but actually think about what do I like to eat fresh, right? Like if you don't like tomatoes, don't grow tomatoes. If you don't like kale, don't grow kale, but think about what you like and then learn how to grow that thing. Start with that thing, get the success with that, enjoy it on your plate. And, and then you're gonna be inspired to continue to grow. Um, use what you have. So again, you don't need to have a whole host of fancy tools and equipment and two wheel tractors and, uh, and hoop houses and, and covered garden spaces. Uh, use the space but, and the tools that you have. Most things you can grow quite simply without anything fancy and, and reduce the barriers to entry, so to speak. Um, just start with what you have. And, and if you, you find that you're enjoying it, you can build your tool collection, your garden tool collection. You can build your, your skills and your experience as you go. Don't reinvent the wheel. There's you know, a lot of good resources out there. Um, and, you know, the internet's a wonderful place. You can get lost in it, but there's also a lot of great, uh, you know, great resources uh, on how to grow. So pick up a book, you know, go to a YouTube channel on backyard gardening and, and growing food and start there and just see what works for you, see what you like and follow that. But, you know, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to bash your head against the wall trying to figure it out on your own because people have come before and, and figured out what works. Once you've kind of got those things, uh, experiment uh, and try new things. Those, you know, they're similar, but there's a distinction. 
And what I mean by experiment is, you know, try different ways of growing, um, you know, try different permaculture practices, make yourself a little um, permaculture uh, food system around a fruit tree with some berry shrubs and some herbs and uh, some onions and garlic and, and try that in one corner of your yard and try a, a built raised bed and try growing in straw or, or grass clippings, which I'll, I'll show you some examples of. Um, and then uh, try new things. So once you've figured out you can grow what you like, try to grow things that you're not sure about. Try to grow things that are look fun to grow um, because those are, are pretty rewarding when you, you know, the first time you see a kohlrabi growing on top of the ground and you never even knew what a kohlrabi was before, like that's a, an exciting feeling. So, so venture outside of your comfort zone a little bit once you've got the basics. Uh, aid is important, don't discourage. You know, professional growers have crop failures because of pest or disease or weather. It, it happens to people that do this for a living and it's gonna happen to the backyard gardener. So the, the key is know that that's gonna happen before you start and don't get discouraged and give up just because your one tomato plant you know, gets hit with a blight and, and dies, but you know, try again next season and you know, try to plant it again and see how far you can get this season. And then finally, uh, be creative with your space. As I said, we don't all have two and a half acres to you know, put out a nice um, block system. So, so think creatively, grow upwards, grow outwards. And, and again, I'll show you some examples of that. So, so in our own property on the left, uh, this is what we came to two years ago um, in the fall. And it was just grass, open, nicely manicured. You know, if somebody would look at that and say, look at that. There's not a weed in sight. It looks nice and clean and crisp. And to the right is what we what we've done with it, and and some might say that that's messy, uh, but we see it and we see uh, rewilded orchards with paths and uh, chicken runs and um, and in the back here uh, a permanent raised beds garden with some trellises to grow up, and you know the diversity of species, uh, both food and uh, pollinator species and just native species. Uh, it has shocked us in just letting this kind of go back to the wild. Uh, again, different examples of raised bed gardens, asparagus growing in a patch under the, uh, under the straw here, peas and beans and cucumbers growing up trellises. Um, and, and there's you know, a number of more examples. So this is the principles that we've sort of taken from urban roots style of growing, biointensive, close spacing, um, permanent raised bed system, which is very easy once you've got it established and if you've got the space to do it. And then you can rotate your food through those different, uh, those different beds. So we have carrots and greens and radishes and garlic uh, on the right here, rows of lettuces and, and mixed greens and brassicas, tomatoes growing up the trellises. Uh, and so we've just played with the things that we like to eat planted them and, and we're seeing what works this year. Some things we've lost already and, and planted you know, something to fill it in. And that's just the way that you know, we decided to go. Um, some other examples, and as Jessica talked about gathering food in the center photo here at the top, this was a hill that goes up to an outbuilding that we have uh, that was just grass. And so we mulched it uh, and covered it with wood chips and dug a, a trench here, or a swale or a dry riverbed. So whenever the water comes off of the structure, it gets slowed down in these rocks and absorbs through the wood chips, watering. What we have here is all vining uh, squashes and melons and things like that. And further down, there's, there's a bunch of different berries and, uh, and things like that. On the right, we have a small herb patch. Again, you know, using mulch, um, doing mixed herb plantings, uh, this is something that anybody could do with this small area in their backyard uh, to add some, some greens in here, lettuces, a couple of onions, you know, tomato plants, and that's a five by five space that you're able to produce a lot of food and a lot of diversity. Um, here's some examples. We're very excited. We're, we're starting to see our first berries this year. Uh, and again, this is all watered by rain coming off of that structure, being captured in that um, in that swale or that you know uh, dry river bed, 
and absorbing into the wood chips. So we rarely have to water and we're still getting some decent fruit production without a lot of effort. Um, I know that um, uh, there's going to be a presentation from Pollinator Pathways Project, so I won't say a lot about this. But um, you know, we tried this year to do a no mow May. We had a, a pretty decent success with it, and and we've kept it. So now we uh, we mow some paths, which you can see in this example around the outskirts and through the yard. But we're keeping the long grass, and so far we haven't gotten any neighbor complaints. But again, that's a piece of the the advocacy that that we're doing with Urban Roots. And I think that every uh, everybody can do a little bit of, which is educating your neighbors, educating your family members who come over and look skeptically at your grass when it's when it's overgrown and it looks like all sorts of weeds. But um, you know, to us, it looks like biodiversity. And when you see the amount of bees and butterflies uh, and other species that are, are visiting our yard, it, you, you can you have no doubts that this, this actually works. Um, and then there's a couple of examples of, of different um, uh, vegetables that we're growing and different methods. And then, you know, the final comment that I'll make about this is that, you know, we're not just growing food for ourselves. We're also growing food for our animal friends uh, and species that like to visit. Oh, I've skipped this slide, but I'll come back to it and um, I'll speak first about the, the animals. So when we started, you know, there was a few birds, there was a few, you know, other critters, but as we continued to rewild our space and green our backyard through food production for ourselves, we realized that we're actually creating a much more dynamic ecosystem um, and seeing a huge boom in species coming and joining us. This um, bee swarm uh, came and visited us uh, about three or four weeks ago and I called um, my friend who is on the board uh, of Urban Roots and we actually were able to, to capture the swarm and, and transport it into a hive, which now is at Urban Roots producing honey and pollinating the plants there. But um, you know, I, I, I don't doubt that that was attracted to our property because of, of what we'd been doing. Um, let me just back up a, a couple of slides and I know that I'm right at the end of my time, but I just wanna mention a couple of things here. So we've got a couple of orchard rows that are going in with some mixed uh, tree plantings. We don't have our trees. So this year um, on this left box here, we just took, this is about uh, 15 feet long, five feet wide or four feet wide. And it, we just put cardboard on the ground, put some uh, topsoil mixed with compost down on top of the cardboard, put some potatoes and some onions on top of that and covered it with straw. Jessica talked about going around and grabbing hay bales from theaters and um, you know the side of the road after Halloween. We did a, a lot of that as well. And now we have you know whole uh, onion and potato planting that's growing there. And this other example here is uh, uh, an homage to our uh, indigenous uh, forebears on the land, which is a corn, beans, and squash planting, which is starting to come up. <coughs> and this is an example of just trying new things, being creative with your space, you know, maximizing the space that you have and looking at beneficial plantings that work well together. Uh, and, and so are these, there's some using height to your advantage with some trellises growing cucumbers and peas uh, and nasturtium climbing up uh, the different fence structures that we have. So these are all examples of how you can take a small space and make it large. Obviously we have a, a bigger space but we're, we're starting small and growing from there. And, and that's what I want to encourage anybody to do. So I'll end there and uh, turn it over and happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. Awesome. So many great examples. So thank you so much, Jacob. Um, our last presenters are Gabor and Lori from Pollinator Pathways Project. Lori grew up on a farm and has gardened since she was six. Her backyard is a sanctuary for nature from poll pollinating insects to the occasional river otter. Gabor is passionate about many aspects of urban sustainability, including pollinator health and urban agriculture. His house is surrounded by an edible forest garden that treats humans and non-human visitors to sumptuous feasts. Hi, can you hear me? 
Okay. Uh, Gabora and I and a few other um, people started the Pollinating Pathways of London um, a few years ago now. And our big goal is to get everybody into gardening and with trying to get them to use native plants. It's so important uh, to use the native plants because it uh, brings back all the birds, butterflies, and bees. Gabor, are you gonna introduce? Sorry, I, I was actually, uh, I think now you can hear me, right? <laughs> I started speaking, but I forgot to unmute myself. Um, so I'm just uh, going to be advancing the slides while Lori talks about pollinators and then the plants and some principles that you can employ in your in your backyard in, in order to green your backyard for pollinators. And then at the end, I'll say a few words about um, uh, our project, the Pollinator Pathways Project, and how you can move from your backyard into your front yard and boulevard and your community parks. Okay, so Lori, let's, uh, I'm here and uh, just let me know when I can go to the next slide. Go ahead. Okay. Well, as we have the pictures here of the bees, the butterflies, the wasps, the moths, the beetles, flies, birds, and bats all help with our pollinating projects that we have. Without them, we wouldn't be here. The bumblebee is a native bee and uh, they pollinate a lot of plants from goldenrod, which is there in the fall, to some of the uh, native anemones and other native plants in the spring. Here's a few, now we go to the butterflies. Uh, the most common one there is the swallowtail butterfly and the monarch butterfly. Um, the monarch butterfly, you have to have milkweed. Um, the milkweed, allows them to get the nectar. And then it also is a host plant, which they can lay eggs on. And when the eggs hatch, the caterpillar comes out and it eats the milkweed. And the milkweed provides them with a special protection because it makes them taste bitter to any predator. Okay. Um, all these are native plants and the nectar from all of them uh, at different times of year, helps with the bees, the butterflies, and the hummingbirds. As you can see, some of them already have bees in them. The bee bomb, the bee bomb has uh, a bumblebee in it, I think it is. And it's very important even for the hummingbirds. Um, if you want to attract hummingbirds, that is a flower to plant. The cone flower also is very good for butterflies. Bees like it too, but the butterflies like it the best. Okay. The tick seed or the coreopsis, the bees, will pollinate this plant readily. They, uh, and then the bee balm, the tick seed is uh, earlier than uh, most plants and then the bee balm and then the aster. It's very important that you have the seasons covered or else the bees can't eat, nor can the butterflies. And this is a spring, a summer and fall planting right here. Okay. And here's the monarch butterfly caterpillar and it's eating the milkweed. And the eastern swallowtails, they like parsley uh, families such as uh, dill, queen's and lace, uh, fennel. If you have these, you will get the caterpillars. They, they have to have it for the host plant. And if you don't have host plants in your gardens, the caterpillars, the butterflies will not lay eggs, so you won't get the false cycles. 
Okay. Here's some of the butterflies and some of the host plants that you can plant in your garden. And some of them are trees, but if you don't have room for the trees, there's always room for a milkweed somewhere or a columbine or an aster, even the turtle heads. And they're, these are all beautiful flowers. So when you think of beauty, you've got a great list there. Okay. It's very important that you provide water for all the pollinating family. Without water, they can't sustain themselves. And when you have your gardens, don't cover up all the dirt. And especially don't use cedar, because if you think about it, cedar chests, they uh, repel the insects. So you should not use cedar as a mulch. The best areas is are the open areas so our native bees can tunnel in and make a home for themselves. The taller vegetation, like grasses, shrubs, even the trees, give them shelter from uh, the weather. The winds, the rains, they need some place to go. Sometimes you can see a bee go right into a flower when it's raining just to protect itself. Okay. And if you're trying to attract all of these insects and uh, the birds and all of them to your garden, if you start using pesticides, fungicides and herbicides, all you do, uh, all you're doing is actually killing them. And you, you're killing us at the same time, but they can't withstand the pesticides at all. Um, you'll just destroy them from the uh, ca caterpillar to the larva stage to the butterfly stage. It's dangerous for them all. There's a wide range of native plants that you can use for your garden to get all the colors you want um, from reds to yellows. And here's just some of them from actually my gardens. And these are our native plants from the blood root, which is early spring. And it has a white flower to the Corygalis, which has a small yellow flower. The barren wart can be pink or yellow. The metal root can grow fairly tall and it's got a, a puffy clouds. And then the woodland poppy, um, I think that's on um, not the endangered species list, but um, it's in, in harm's way from all the pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, and people planting on top of them. And then the Solomon seal. Ginger, uh, water leaf, and bloodroot. Blue eye grass, you can't see the actual flower on the blue eye grass, but this is my favorite plant. Um, then the ferns for the protection, blood root again. Violets, there's certain butterflies that if you don't have violets in your garden, you won't attract the butterflies because it's a host plant for them. And then the yellow violets, the Corydalis, Neapples and ferns, and Chimichuga. Water leaf again, marsh marigolds. There's so many plants to choose from. And as Gabor has here, you build it and they will come. We've been putting in gardens throughout, our, throughout the city and trying to get a path going down Dundas Street. We've got uh, one garden that was completed this spring. It's got to fill in, but that's at the museum. And then we have other gardens that uh, we have put in place. I think the board can talk more to you about the gardens we've been doing. Yeah, I, I'll take over. Thanks so much, Lori. So just a few more words about uh, our organizations. Um, organization, uh, the, the P3 organization 
Um, Lori just mentioned that we started on this big project, the Dundas Street Pollinator Pathway. We planted uh, a big garden at Museum London, so make sure you check that out. Uh, you can pick up uh, or download our flyers. I'll, I'll put that in the in the chat, but you can go to our website and under resources, you'll find uh, two flyers, one which is get specific into what to do. So we're in the business of empowering people to plant a pollinator garden, but more importantly, to grow a network of pollinator gardens. And in order to do that, we really need to work on our social skills and our people to people skills, because uh, we are, uh, here, you know, we're the ones who are creating these gardens and we do a much better job when we share resources, we share ideas, we share seeds with our neighbors uh, who could be down on the street or on the other side of our city. So I'll just show you what we've been able to accomplish uh, in specifically in where we live in Kensington Village with Lori and I. So this is, these the yellow dots are the most of them are, are new gardens that have uh, been created because of our project. Some of them, have, of course, have existed for a longer period. And uh, people have put in small to larger gardens. I'll, sh I'll show you uh, some pictures. We even um, took over the, without asking too many questions from the city, but this is a traffic island and we've kind of assumed management of it. We turned it into a poll community pollinator garden. You can go on uh, on Google Maps and uh, and actually find uh, some more pictures. So here's here's some of when we got started two years ago. Here it is uh, by the end of the season. You can see how we try to match the the, the signs, the road signs, with uh, the colors of plants. And then this is what it looks like, pretty much. It's at the corner of Forward and Woodward. Come and check it out. Here are some more pictures of the gardens throughout Kensington Village. And now the pollinators, including bees, butterflies, have a much easier time in, in navigating this uh, part of the city because there are small patches of habitat for them. This is uh, a, a larger site uh, in one of the food forests. We've uh, hosted various workshops. This was a really exciting day as part of the 100 uh, in one day uh, series of events, building uh, bee hotels and planting uh, pollinator friendly plants. Uh, you can pick up a sign from us. So this is on the back end of, of our, our yard sign. And if you're wondering what species to pick, there's lots of resources on the internet. We've also created a kind of the easy guide to figuring out native plants. And so these are the, the ones that grow well in a sunny pollinator garden, but we have suggestions for uh, shady gardens as well. Uh, so here are the resources that you'll find on our website. So make sure that you, you download these. And uh, just uh, let me put in a word about growing food on the boulevard, right? So you can, uh, expand your garden and this is a really good way to engage your neighbors when you start uh, gardening not in your backyard but in your front garden or in your boulevard garden you strike up amazing conversations you get to know your neighbors this is how I started this is how a lot of these the neighbors here started and we are continuing with our various uh, gardening projects including this one so thanks everybody and I look forward to all your questions. Okay, that's it from from the Pollinator Pathways project. Okay, so thank you so much to all our speakers. I learned something new during each of your presentations. Now it's time for our Q and A session. So feel free to raise your hand on Zoom if you'd like to speak and ask your question live and I will call on you or you can just type in your questions into the chat and Tina will ask the question for you. And since Jessica has to hop off the call a little sooner, we will take a few questions you have for her specifically first. I see this, what should I, should I take that question? Yep, in the chat, um, someone asked, okay. did Jessica speak about rain barrels? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, ra rain barrels are, are uh, a great start. Um, they There are programs that you can get them free from different places. Um, there are different, if you want a, a prettier one, there's lots of different styles you can get from, uh, um, from hardware stores. Um, uh, it's important that you, in our climate, you need to turn them upside down in the winter. And um, uh, even if you drain them, if, you, if they're still open on the top, you can have some water, melt water getting in and then they'll crack. Um, so it's important to make sure that you store them properly for the winter um, and have mosquito netting on the top as well. Um, but typical rain barrels, like, so we get um, in London, there's um, a, just over a thousand milliliters of precipitation uh, yearly and about half of that a little over half of that falls during the growing season and the rest falls as snow um, but so if you were going to capture that if you wanted to capture what was actually falling on your roof um, if you captured all the water that was falling on your roof of the year you would probably have enough for all your water needs in there like flushing toilets bathing food um, production. There, there's uh, obviously legal issues with that, but um, really uh, rain barrels don't do much for your garden. The amount of water that they store, um, in, especially in the, in the torrential downfalls that we're having now, um, they'll fill up in a few minutes and then, um, and then you've got to make sure you drain them before the next rain. <laughs> so um, they are good to have there as a backup. If you, I, I really recommend getting a few in series so that you connect them to each other and so that you have them fill up. Um, most rain barrels that you can buy commercially are like 200 to 300 um, liters. Whereas um, if you get uh, an IBC tote, um, which is a, it's a thousand liter tank uh, and they, um, they take up more space and they're kind of ugly, but you're, there are ways that you can screen them with vegetation or with, um, with uh, art or boards. Um, uh, but a thousand liter tank goes a lot further. It would be the equivalent of three or four rain barrels in series. And then if you have two or three thousand liter tanks uh, in series, that's even better. Um, so yes, rain barrels, um, rain barrels are a good start, um, but then uh, you also wanna make sure you're managing the overflow from them. So there always has to be an overflow um, from every uh, water storage system. And then, then you can send that water, that overflow into your swale system or um, uh, into a little settling pond where it'll seep into the ground. Um, uh, and, and then it can, um, can water your plants possibly too. Awesome. So um, there is a, there's another question from the chat. And this question is directed towards everyone. And it's, I live in, and the person has said, I live in an area that has a lot of clay. Are there any native plants that grow well in areas that are like this? Uh, and anybody can answer this if they would like to. I could jump in if you don't mind, because I grow in a clay backyard. <laughs> so um, I'll just look out the window and tell you what's doing really well. Right now, I am in love with um, fringed loosestrife. It's a yellow native loosestrife, not related to purple loosestrife. They have the same common name, but it spreads and it fills in your garden really well. And it's full of yellow flowers this time of year. And it loves a clay soil. It's um, fine drying out, but I have it in a fairly kind of you know, squishy clay soil, um, fairly low lying. What else do I have back there? Uh, Liatris, a dense blazing star, ironweed are pretty good choices for a clay soil. Um, I have a few different types of goldenrod. Uh, the one that I am enjoying the most right now is viscid goldenrod, which is like a, a grassy leafed, low but spreading goldenrod. Um, I would try one of those. And my absolute favorite, yellow hyssop. It's very tall, uh, but it's super good for bees. Um, I'll stop there because I know other people will have recommendations for clay too. Um, would anyone else like to jump in? Uh, if not, we can move on to an oh, I, I could have a, a question about that. Um, those are harder to find species and even um, I know you you put up some um, some nurseries but um, and, and you're doing some research on on the supply of plants to the public um, but even as somebody like I, I buy a lot of 
plants and I and I work with a lot of different nurseries and um, and it's you know I, there are some plants I've been searching for years to try and find uh, even a few to to, to purchase uh, and plant so um, where would you be able to buy um, yellow loose strife or viscid goldenrod or yellow hyssop? The yellow hyssop, I think a few people grow. Um, Prairie Song Nursery is one of my favorite new smaller nurseries that's come up in mm -hmm. Norfolk County. Um, there's another one called Seed Box Nursery. There's a lot of new smaller nurseries that are popping up um, all over the place. Also, definitely always try Ontario native plants. They do the mail order and they mm -hmm. typically have a very large diversity, but you have to kind of order well in advance of the spring season. Um, the North American Native Plant Society has a really great series of plant sales every year. This year it was online, but they deal with, I would say, a lot of expert hobbyists you know what I mean who are growing some specialty things so yeah those are maybe you have to hunt a little bit more for but um more common clay loving species are like hairy beard tongue for dry clay and uh foxglove beard tongue for maybe a lower clay like a moisture clay but um yeah sorry good point I mean those two are, are a little bit obscure but um you could find them. I'll help you find them. <laughs> let me let me know. Okay. Send me your email. If I can sort of add to the the question about growing in clay uh, from a food perspective, and and you know whether native or not, and I'm sure that um, you know the same principles would apply whether you're growing food or or other species. Um, but one of the things that I, I didn't mention it during the presentation, although I, I briefly alluded to um, the, the way that we have potatoes and onions. Uh, on top of the native soil by uh, sheet mulching with cardboard, adding a thin layer of, of compost and topsoil, and then growing on top of that, you're preserving the soil structure, whether it's clay or mixture of other things. Um, you're, you're mulching down the grass and, and weed and other things that are there and growing on top of that. And by doing that, you're you're preserving that and you're not planting directly into clay, which some, especially sort of food species might struggle with, but into a looser mixture of, of compost, uh, preferably that you've made or that you've, you've sourced locally. Um, so that can help to avoid the struggles with growing directly into clay. Um, and that can either be just on right on top of the ground or in a, a raised bed, a built raised bed um, that you do. So that, that's a solution as well. Um, if you're looking at that, and, and it doesn't have to be complex, it can be as simple as, um, as I said, you know, sheet mulching with newspaper or you know, non um, non inked cardboard, like just plain uh, brown cardboard, and that will help to suppress the the grass and and other uh, weeds that might be there, while your your planting is getting set up, and then just a sprinkling of soil uh, enough for the seed to to start taking root. The, the sheet mulch will break down and then the roots will be strong enough to then press into that soil. So it will actually also help to, um, to generate vitality in that soil as you're growing, as opposed to you know, working hard to, to till and break up that clay and, and adding all sorts of amendments to it. So, so think about that uh, rather than fighting against it, work, work with it or, or grow on top of it. Perfect, thank you all so much for your responses. So this next question here is for Pollinator Pathways. Um, and they're asking, uh, could uh, Gabar recommend pollinator plants to, more, to attract more butterflies rather than bees? My garden is at the front of my property next to a public sidewalk that has a lot of children and traffic and they thank you guys. All right, so Laura, did you hear the question? I, I have a, I have two suggestions, but Lori will have a lot more. She's she's a, the gardening expert. Um, I know that in my garden I have coneflower, and it does attract a lot of uh, butterflies. And last year, for the first time, we grew an annual, which is zinnia. And I believe it is native, maybe not to this area, but it's native to North America. Someone can correct me. But zinnias 
are loved by butterflies. <laughs> and then Laurie, if, uh, please jump in. You'll know a lot, lot more species that are that are, attract more butterflies than bees. By the way, they, they both spe uh, bees and 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 butterflies will visit some you know same plant, but there are some that will are more uh, attractive to butterflies. Laurie? Can you hear me? Yeah. I think uh, the Monardas, anything in the Monarda family, they you'll get the hummingbirds and the butterflies. Um, anything with a, um, a trumpet uh, flower, you'll get more of the butterflies and, and hummingbirds, uh, the bearded tongue, the cone flower, um, the monardus. Uh, there are a few others that have the trumpet flower. And it, the tr it, trumpet flower doesn't have to be an individual flower all by itself. Um, it can be a cluster of them, but it's a trumpet flower shape. I think even the butterfly weed is a good one. And of course the milkweed. Does that help? The, the milkweed is for the, the, the caterpillar stage. Yeah, but they also get the nectar. Okay, thank you for all of your suggestions. Um, so there, uh, one person has asked about mulching. So are leaves or straws better than um, the standard mulchers that are out there? And anybody can answer if they would like. Um, Sophia, what is your, uh, I guess, I mean, the, I'll answer it generically, but um, it depends on your context. Um, the, there's a, the problem with using leaves that you've just raked and, and are just, um, uh, that are in their full form is that they tend to mat when they get wet. And so it, it creates an, um, an anoxic state and it smothers out some of the, the beneficial insects and microbes and, um, and can get pretty slimy. Whereas with straw mulch, it, you know, it's got a lot more air space through it. So if you're gonna use leaves, you wanna shred it, like put it through a garden shredder or run over it with your lawnmower a couple of times to break up those pieces. So there's uh, less big leaves and more small, uh, small leaves. Those break down faster, add nutrients into your soil and into what you're, you're growing underneath of. Um, straw and, and, uh, and hay are, are great, uh, preferably if you can get them without seed so that they don't sprout all over you. But if, if you go to like uh, you know, PV or, or Home Depot, you can get sort of straw mulch products, which are pretty well broken down. Or like Jessica and I said, uh, you can you know, drive, drive around on Halloween, you know, after Halloween and, and pick up people's straw bales that they've put out at the side of the road on, on leaf waste day and store them over the winter. And that helps them to break down a little bit. And then you can use them in your gardens in the spring. Um, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, the question, like the standard mulches out there is, um, you know, leaves and straw are great because they're free and they're natural and they're, they're local. If you're importing mulches or you're, uh, like a, a wood chip mulch from, uh, you know, from the Home Depot that's in a bag and it's going to cost you $8 and it's going to be dyed with black or red or something like that, then definitely going natural is going to be better if you're planting and especially if you're, if you're planning on growing food uh, in the area that you're mulching. Um, but you can also, uh, as Jessica mentioned, look to, you know, if you've got somebody who's Who's having some having an arborist take down some trees in your neighborhood? Uh, you know, go up to the truck and ask them if they can just drop off the the fresh wood chip mulch and use that because that's great as well. Um, anything that doesn't have the dyes or preservatives in it is going to be great. And yeah, standard. Okay, I see it. Perfect. Thanks, Sophia. So yeah, standard mulch, bark, um, cedar, pine, etc. So. Um, you know, I think I just answered that. Like, if it's if it's fresh, or if you're able to get it from, um, you know, from a, a place where you know that it doesn't have dyes or preservatives in it, then that's going to be fine. Um, 
if it, and again, it depends on your context and what you're growing. Um, if you're if you're planning on mulching over top of more delicate things uh, like some of your annual vegetables or, or flowers, and using things that are um, finer, so straws or, or really finely shredded leaf uh, mulch is going to be better than wood chips, which can tend to be sharp or have points that can damage those more delicate stems uh, as they're growing. Um, and they, they provide nutrition faster to your plants, whereas it, the wood chip mulch takes longer to break down. Um, and uh, I think Jessica mentioned it briefly, um, or, or no, maybe it was Lori actually, about certain types of mulches um, can add different things to your soil and it can be uh, detrimental to some of the species there. I think Laurie mentioned cedar isn't good for uh, certain species. Um, so, so it depends on what you're looking at doing. Generally all of it's pretty good um, as long as you're, you're sourcing it locally, you know where it's coming from and it doesn't have preservatives in it, but you just want to watch out for things that can cause that, that matting um, like thick uh, big leafed uh, mulch. Just a, a follow-up comment about wood mulches. So wood chips in uh, an annual garden, like a food growing garden, uh, they tend to uh, favor the growth of uh, hyphae, of, of, of uh, mycelium, of, of fungi. And in, in annual gardens, you want to favor bacteria over the, the, the fungi. So I I tend to put the, if, if I get um, wood uh, mulches, I put them in, under my fruit trees um, and the leaves and the straws uh, in the food growing areas. And uh, another word of caution about straw bales, someone pointed this out, is that those farmers that are not organic and they're growing wheat, guess what? Just before harvesting, they spray with glyphosate, Roundup as a desiccant. And so if you get that straw bale, you might be getting the res residual effect of that glyphosate. I don't know how fast it breaks down, but uh, word of caution. Um, so I tend to now always ask whether the, where the, st the straw was grown. So uh, I, I, ha I think I, I, I still have a contact. So if anyone's interested, then I can give you that contact to organically grown straw. Or, or weed that you know is put into straw bales. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. So another question from the chat from Hadley. So they've asked, I've been looking at lawn replacements. Are there any recommendations on the best way to replace grass with clover or any other type of lawn replacement? I can offer one suggestion. I had a corner of, we moved into a new house two years ago, the corner of the lawn was just ugly and not performing. Rather than trying to reseed it and get grass, I put in strawberry, wild strawberry. Um, so I'm using woodland strawberry uh, for Gary Vesca, but it grows very fast. <laughs> and now people stop and comment on my lawn that's full of wild strawberry. So that's a really quick and easy way. Uh, native ground covers. There's other low growing um, native plants that might work as well, like field pussy toes, like hairy beard tongue, uh, like blue eyed grass. I think somebody mentioned that previously. These are all really great low grow native replacements of lawn, but of course, I'm sure you could turn it into food production area. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm sure someone has comments about that. There's also. Oh, sorry, 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 continue. That you can put in. Go ahead, Lori. If you were going to say something, I think you're going to add in. Now, now you've muted yourself, Lori. Uh, I'm not sure if Laurie was going to say something, but I'll just add um, uh, to, to Hadley. Um, one of the things that, that we've done is the, the very simple method of doing nothing and, uh, and just letting uh, our lawn grow. 
and, and seeing what comes up and, you know, what looked like a very sort of clean and, and fairly pristine grass lawn when we started, as we just allowed it to grow longer between cuttings, um, we, you know, we recognized that there was, you know, several species of clover and, and other, um, you know, flower producing. We have a whole patch of our, our backyard, which has wild strawberries in it, which we never noticed um, until we allowed it to grow for more than, you know, two or three weeks before cutting. And, and then just allowing those things to, to grow and see what's growing there and growing well in that system, uh, you know, then you might be able to determine, you know, if you can add more seeds of that, it's obviously doing well without any assistance. So seeding with things that are already doing well in your area is a, is a good way to go. And, you know, as Stefan said, he put in some wild strawberries and it, it really took off. Um, you know, one, one way to do that is to, you know, um, I can't remember, I think it was Gabe Brown who, who or, or maybe Mark Shepard is a regenerative agriculture sort of uh, speaker um, and educator talks about the stun method, sheer total utter neglect just do, doing nothing uh, and seeing what works and what thrives, you know, those types of things want to grow in your area. And, and you know, grass doesn't, you know, you, you see, you'll see in, in a month, uh, you know, the people that don't water their lawns and the people that do, because the people that don't water their lawns and they mow it every week, they're, you know, they've basically got soil and, and yellow dead grass, whereas the people that do, you know, maybe it's greener, Whereas the people, you know, like like Gabor and Lori and Stefan and, and I and I'm sure Jessica, you know, that, that have a diverse ecosystem and probably don't water our lawns, still have a vibrant, you know, green and color filled uh, system. So so think about it that way, rather than, you know, what do I need to do to change things? Just let it be and observe, which is, um, you know, Jessica would tell you the first principle of permaculture is just to observe and just to let things be on their own and see what happens and then see how you can support that rather than intervening and changing that uh, system arbitrarily. So, so I encourage you to do that. Thank you. Um, and I think this next question is also um, directed towards Jacob, but um, someone is asking if anybody could talk more about growing in grass cutting. Sure. So, so grass cuttings and, and, you know, Gabor's caution about, you know, straw and, you know, not necessarily knowing where it comes from is, is a good one. And it's warranted to think about those things. And one way as an alternative to that, if you are mowing uh, a section of your lawn or all of your lawn, um, in saving those grass cuttings and letting them dry out somewhere to create your own, what you know, uh, hopefully it doesn't have any uh, pesticides, herbicides, glyphosate, anything like that on your own grass, you can use those grass cuttings as an alternative to a straw mulch, either in your annuals beds in between your plants to suppress weeds and hold moisture. Or um, I didn't have the picture of it up, but I showed the picture of the potatoes and onions growing under straw. Uh, we have an experimental spot where we're, we're growing potatoes under grass cuttings um, from when we went through uh, after no mow May and carved some paths in our yard. We just took those grass cuttings and put them right on top of the potatoes that are just on top of the soil. So um, it's, it's called the Ruth Stout method, uh, named after a, a really ingenious um, woman named Ruth Stout, uh, last name's S-T-O-U-T, which I would encourage you to look at, which is a very simple way of growing underneath of mulches and her principle was just use what you have leaves grass clippings you know other yard waste um, mix them if you if you need to and so we're like I said we're just experimenting with a lot of that um, and so you're not you're not planting into the grass cuttings you're using it as a mulch either around your vegetables or, or over top of what you're growing if it's those types of root vegetables. Awesome, thank you. And I'm just gonna ask the last question and this is from Catherine. So Catherine has asked, what would be a native conifer to plant to replace the spruce that has been lost? I'd like some ideas that stay dark green through winter and would provide good cover for birds during the winter as well. 
could jump in quick first. Um, I would recommend actually a white cedar, believe it or not. They do become very large trees over time and are quite stately and attractive and provide dense you know, cover for some birds. However, you might like the look of a white pine better. They're a bit more kind of feathery, airy, um, maybe a bit um, less kind of wide. Um, other than that, you could consider um, something like a red cedar as well, depending on how large you want it to be over time. I'll stop there. Um, would anyone else like to chime in? If not, we can continue. I think um, I think that would be the end of our question session. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. And thank you to the speakers, volunteers that helped organize this event. And thanks to everyone for your questions and participation. I really hope you enjoyed this event. 